Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Work From Home Show. All the homies, homeboys, homegirls, home trans. We greatly appreciate you tuning in to us. I am Naresh Vissa with my co-host Adam Schrader. And on the line is Jeffrey Selengo. He is an award-winning journalist for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, and several other well-known publications. He He's a special advisor to the president at Arizona State University and a visiting scholar at Georgia Tech. He is the best-selling author. Some of these books have hit number one on various lists. But he's a best-selling author of College Unbound, The Future of Higher Education and What It Means for Students. So we're going to talk about this topic specifically as it relates to studying from home Uh, and working from home, too. He's also the author of There is Life After College, What Parents and Students Should Know About Navigating School to Prepare for the Jobs of Tomorrow. So we're going to talk about that book and topic in depth as well. He's author of the book Mook You, Who is Getting the Most Out of Online Education and Why? So another very relevant topic to today, and that's online education at all levels, not just college, but elementary, middle, and high school. And he's the author of the new book, Who Gets In and Why? A Year Inside College Admissions. So this is a different sort of interview, different topic, but very relevant to the current online and digital workspace, as well as the online and digital education space. So Jeffrey Salingo, thanks for joining us on the Work From Home Show. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, let's start with probably a question that you've been getting a lot over the past six months or so, and that is the future of higher education. Is it dead or is the future studying from home or is the future going to go back to how things were in 2019? (laughs) <laughs> well, it's definitely not going to go back to the way it was in 2019. I think that, um, nor is it going to be all studying at, at home. Um, I think we're going to really get a mix of both uh, in the best of both worlds. I think ha- some form of hybrid education is here to stay, uh, which means that some students probably will be taking more courses online fully. Others will be taking still face-to-face courses uh, more fully, but I think that for the average experience now in college is going to be a mix of both. Some of your classes will be online. Some individual classes will be online. So you might take a class online on Monday and go into the classroom on Wednesday, for example. So I think you're going to have a mix of both, but clearly we're not going back to 2019. Well, I'll tell you, as somebody who graduated this, uh, or I should say the, the, the last decade, I got two different degrees, undergrad and and master's, and I tell you, the in-person experience of college is so crucial. So to me, that's where the value was. And if I hear that, oh, you know, we're going to do 30% online or 50% online, I just, I'm not really sure that the, the cost is justifiable, at least a private university. I'm not really sure it's justifiable, especially because so many of these courses are available for free online, whether you go to Coursera or Khan Academy. When I say courses, I mean the material um, or even just going on Amazon and finding books related to the subject. It's just it's changing a lot. And I'm a parent now. I was not a parent 10 years ago when I was in college, but I'm a parent now. And I think about, OK, 20 years from now, when, when my children are going to college, is it going to be worth it if they're just going to be at home for 30% of the time or 50% of the time. I just feel like it's so important to get out there, live alone and, and live your life. And, and I think that's what's, what's starting to happen now is that co- institutions are rethinking not only how they deliver to students, but I think increasingly parents and students are starting to think 
alternative ways of doing this education. And, and that may be not the four year traditional face to face degree residential experience. It may be increasingly a two year degree that you then transfer to a four year institution. It may be a set of individual courses that from Google, for example, that roll up to a, a four year degree. The other thing that I think will change coming out of this pandemic is that people who have always been concerned about the price of higher education, and not only those people, but everybody else now, I think is going to start to think, what am I getting for the money I'm spending, that ROI on the degree? So your new book, The Who Gets In and Why, I can't believe this wasn't Narisha's first question, A Year Inside College Admission. <laughs> what do you think of the, the Lori Laughlin situation? And is that something that you think is more pervasive than we know? And will anything like this happen whenever things go more virtual? Is it more per- pervasive? I think that people getting in for what we think of is not qualified, I think is more pervasive because we all have different expectations of what qualified means. And one of the things I found in the book is that the admission system never was a meritocracy. It never was fair. It never will be a meritocracy. It never will be fair. If you don't get into the school that you want to get into, you think the process is rigged, is against you, is wrong, is unfair. And and yes, the parents in the Varsity Blue scandal went to lengths that nobody ever expected and nobody ever probably did in the past. In other words, you know, making up the fact that you, uh, you know, you played a sport that you didn't play, for example. But people have always tried to cheat on the exams. People have always tried to give big donations to colleges. So that's not new. Does it happen at a, uh, does it happen, you know, to the majority of the class coming in? No, but there will always be students on the edges who get into college who most of us will think didn't deserve to get in. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's not just college, but if uh, I, I just happen to go to some of the top private schools in, in the city of Houston, and it's you have all these legacies, people whose grandfathers donated a ton, a ton of money, have their names on the building. You go on to, to colleges, reputable colleges, same situation there. But even though, and I, our listeners probably know this, I lean right politically, I'm actually in favor of the liberal arts education, which to me includes... Uh, getting that holistic experience. It's, I don't believe in a, a pure meritocracy when it comes to college admissions. And my community, I'm an Indian American, you're probably aware that there is a group of us suing the University of California system. And also, I believe there's a lawsuit against Yale University um, because we are essentially being discriminated against uh, because other students who don't have as good grades, as good test scores, as good extracurriculars are getting in over us. And I actually disagree with with the lawsuits because this is not a job. This is not a business. It's, like I said to me, a liberal arts education. And I wouldn't want to go to a school that's completely homogenous. I think it's very important that um, it, it, it's not just about race or, or color or ethnicity, but it's about just getting a complete, holistic, diverse experience. And I think that's one of the issues here is that as the country gets more diverse and as we know that a college degree is uh, increasingly a gatekeeper to the middle class and to good jobs, which it wasn't really 40 years ago, you could get a uh, you could get a certificate. In some cases, you didn't even have to go to Um, a college to get a great job. But increasingly, as that happens, and it's harder to get into the most selective schools, and higher education is more expensive than ever before, all of these issues are coalescing around kind of our anxiety about the future. Um, And that, um, you know, opportunity is very scarce right now. And people are angry, and they're upset. Uh, and, And I don't blame them. Uh, you know, we shouldn't have this very narrow pathway that we have into what are good jobs. Uh, we shouldn't ask people to mortgage their future, uh, especially parents to mortgage their future to pay for their kids to go to college. So there's all of these issues coming up at the same time, which is what I, why I think we're seeing so much anxiety right now around what is happening in, in higher education. So looking at the online education you know, as colleges, you know, you were talking about the price just skyrocketing. And as the price skyrockets and people look at more education from home, possibly cheaper education, 
do you think we're going to start seeing, you know, obviously the college degree will still be useful, but people going more for going to school from home and getting certifications and people looking at the certifications as in this is an as good as a college degree so that people can educate themselves for home for, you know, a 20th or a hundredth of the price of college and that the online work from home, work school from home might become more pervasive in that regard? I don't know if we're going to have school from home, but I, I think what we are going to have is what I mentioned earlier, is this idea of not a single pathway. So I could imagine somebody going and getting this Google certificate, going to work at Google, and maybe while they're there, taking some online courses, maybe going to the local community college to take a few courses. I, I see many more pathways to these these good jobs. My only concern, and you were mentioning the, the liberal arts degree before, or the liberal arts education, is that there is something special, and we don't quite know what it is. There's something special, there's some special sauce in that coming of age moment mm -hmm. between 18 and 22, that college has had the corner on that market, right? It is the residential experience where you throw a bunch of people together at the age of 18, and they come out four years later, very different. And we can't tease out exactly what happens in that moment, but we know it happens. And <laughs> if that goes away, if we start to see people take different pathways, um, and I love that experience, trust me, I had that experience, but it's very expensive. So how do we take that experience, give people that broad education that they need, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom? That's the key right now. I think that's the question that many of us have on, their mind, on our minds. Well, I think part of being liberal is being open-minded and I, and I am open-minded to new ideas simply because this is a way things have been done for such a long time. When I say this is a way, I mean college and going away and living in the dorm, living off campus and partying and studying. And it, I'm, I'm, I'm open to seeing what the alternatives are and, and how that works out. Maybe they don't work out. Maybe we look back 10 years from now and say, oh, you know what, it, it, college is extremely important. We need to go back to the whole four-year degree idea. But I'm, I'm just curious to see how things work out. You know, I, I, I would hope that we could. There, again, there is something special about putting together people at the age of 18, young adults. They're not even young adults. They're really still teenagers at the age of 18. There's something about that maturation process that is, is critically important in getting people ready for the rest of life. My concern, though, is it's just too expensive. And so if we could figure out a better way of delivering it, but still have some of the key aspects of that experience, and I think part of it is living together with people at that age. I think part of it is the hands-on experience, but a lot of it isn't the sports. It isn't to be honest with you, the classroom experience, I think some of that could be moved online. I think the relationships between the faculty and the students are important, but we could move that to face-to-face -to -face and maybe have more stuff happening online and thus reduce the cost of all of this. Because once you bundle, and this was really the thesis of my first book, is because once you bundle all this together, the residential experience, eating, living together, you know, these are mini cities that's where all your cost comes from. Yeah, I went to the University of Texas and saying it was a mini city is uh, underscoring <laughs> it a little bit. Uh, one of the dorms had its own zip code because there were so many people in it. But oh, wow. <laughs> when you're talking about um, you know getting the most out of online education, when you were researching for your book, do you did you see many different outcomes between those people who went to you know solely an online community uh, online college versus those who went to a, an in-person in school, not just in terms of you know the development we were talking about, but the outcomes, were they better or worse in that regard? No, because at the end of the day, in, increasingly employers want skills. They're hiring on skills. Yes, the signal of the degree matters, but many of these online institutions that are offered, where the online degrees are offered by face-to-face -face colleges, physical colleges, you can't even tell the difference between the degree says the University of Massachusetts or Arizona State University or Southern New Hampshire University, you have no idea if they were on campus or not. Um, and by the way, this year, many of those students at every college are going to have an online experience. You know, a quarter of their undergraduate experience might be online. So this distinction between online and face-to-face -face when it comes to employers, I think, is going to even lessen 
in the coming years because they're most interested, can you do the job? Do you have the skills? And I think hiring is going to move more in that direction. Will the signal of Yale and Harvard and Stanford still matter? Sure it will. But there's only about a couple dozen colleges that have that strong signal. And because of that, I think we're increasingly going to move to this skills-based education. Well, I'll tell you, I, I have a degree from, from Duke University, and being a, a, a business owner and an entrepreneur, I found that degree to hold more value socially than it does professionally. In fact, most of the people who I work with, whether it's uh, people who work for my companies or um, other business clients who we work with, they don't know what degrees I have, where, to, where I went to school. But um, I, I just kind of noticed that socially, which isn't talked about it enough, that's where it's, it's come into play. Yeah, exactly. And, and that to me is what's going to be critically important is what are the resources that a college has in the future um, uh, and what, how are they going to help get their students a job, right? We see this already in how students look for a college. When you ask college freshmen these days, every year UCLA takes a survey of college freshmen and they ask, what is your number one purpose for coming to college? And since 2008, it has been to get a job. Before 2008, it was to get a broad education. And well, we all know what happened in 2008. It was the Great Recession. And so what we're seeing as a result of that is that increasingly we see college as a means to an end. And those colleges that are able to deliver on the promise that they can help students get a job are going to be the ones that are going to succeed in the long run. Do you think universities and teachers in particular are ready for this massive shift to online education in this year and potentially the next, you know, two or three years? I think some are, but I don't think all are. That's for sure. Because uh, we, you know, we, we, about, if you take the entire, uh, entire college faculty, for example, a third of them were already doing a lot of work online. Uh, in, including teaching entire courses online. A third were incorporating technology in a big way in their classrooms. A third were not. And, and I think some of them are, have really struggled uh, in this pivot to online education over the last couple of months. And, and that's a real problem uh, for colleges and, and universities. Uh, but I think we're going to start to judge colleges and universities now on the quality of their faculty and how they're able to be more flexible in teaching, both face-to-face -face and online. We have Jeffrey Slingo, well-known, award-winning journalist and best-selling author of multiple books on education. Jeffrey, you talked about probably the biggest issue with higher education being the tuition. What would be your solution to fix this problem of tuition? <laughs> Do we have two hours? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so, you, so you actually have a pretty well thought out. Uh, no, I don't. I, I don't. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's a hard because it goes back to all the issues we were just talking about. We have to get a control on cost first. There is a big divide between the cost of education on a campus and what they actually charge. Most the average discount rate, meaning the average price students actually pay in tuition at a campus is about 50%. The national average for a, college, a, a tuition discount is 50%, meaning that not at all colleges, but at many colleges, students are only paying about half of the advertised sticker price. And so colleges are depending on some students to pay full price. It's like an airline, right, where the guy next to you or the woman next to you is, uh, is paying the full price of the ticket and you're on a discounted ticket. Um, I guess nobody's sitting next to each other on airlines anymore, but you get the point. Uh, where it, it is, It's the same way in, in a college classroom. Everyone's paying a different price and many of them are not paying the full price. Thus, colleges have to continue to increase that overall sticker price because every year they're getting less and less of it from students. That, to me, is also divorced from reality for the actual cost of running the college. We, if you ask a typical CFO on a college campus, how much does it cost you to educate an English major? How much does it cost you to educate an engineering major? They have no idea. <laughs> how much does it really cost to run your uh, athletics department? No, they might know that. But they don't really know how much some of the individual costs of running that city, that mini city we were talking about, actually, what, what it actually costs to run that. 
we have to get a handle on that first. We have to understand what really drives the revenue at a college and university. We have to understand why students are really coming there. We have to cut out those costs that don't matter anymore. It's very easy on college campuses to just do more and more and more and not stop doing what you used to do. And then we have to align the price of college with what it actually costs. So if only students are only paying for half, then we need to start to drive the cost down closer to half to actually what it costs to deliver that. I think it shows a lot about our education priorities as you were listing that and saying they don't know what this costs or that costs. But sports, we know how much the sports <laughs> cost because you know you got to look at what's the what the important parts are. So when you started writing, why did you pick uh, the subject of colleges? Uh, because I think that it goes back to what we started out with, that college is a entry point to the rest of life. It is a it is a coming of age moment. You know, think about all the Hollywood movies that have talked about that as a coming of age movement, being on campus moment, I should say. Um, and then increasingly over the last 40 years, we have this divide in our political system and everything. Did you go to college? Do you have a college degree or not? Uh, it's it's who you vote for. It's where you live. It's the amount of money you make. It's whether you have good health. I mean, it, healthy, healthier people have college degrees. Unhealthy people don't. Uh, it's whether you have stable jobs. It's whether you're employed. So much all comes back to the fact of whether you have a college degree. And as I said earlier, it's increasingly becoming difficult for some people to access that degree. They might be able to get in. Sometimes they can't, sometimes they can, but then even when they get in, can they afford it? Jeff, you uh, also wrote the book, There is Life After College, What Parents and Students Should Know About Navigating School to Prepare for the Jobs of Tomorrow. So let's talk about the jobs of tomorrow. We've talked about the, the college of tomorrow, but as far as the jobs of tomorrow go, what are your predictions and how can students who may and parents who are at home right now listening to this show, what advice would you have for them? Well, <laughs> it's hard to predict what the job market's going to look in like in 10 years or even five years. But we know that there are some foundational skills that are critical for students. And it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, the kind of those liberal arts skills. The ability to communicate, the ability to work in teams, the problem, the, the ability to problem solve. Those are skills that will take you no matter what job you have throughout your career. It will allow you to change jobs throughout your career. Then there are specific skills that you need. Um, and, and, and those might change from year to year or every couple of years. So that ability to learn and reskill. Right. I, I even just think about what's happened in the six months of this pandemic. I used to be on the road every week. I used to be uh, speaking in front of hundreds or thousands of people in some cases. I, I had to pivot my own work and my own business and my own writing. And I had to take, I took courses to try to figure out how to do better online programs. I took courses on how to teach online courses, right? I, was, I had a mindset that to survive these last six months, I had to do something different. And that is in some ways the skill that every employer is also looking for, that you're able to be flexible and to learn, and that you're constantly curious. Those to me, forget about what are the jobs I'm going to have five years from now, because we don't know what those jobs are. We sometimes don't even know what exact skills they're going to have, meaning the hard skills. But we do know that this ability to work in teams, problem solve, communicate, write, all those skills are going to be critically important. I want to add one thing to that. So a couple of years ago, Burning Glass Technologies, which studies the job market in real time, studied 20 million job ads around the world. And they looked for those critical skills I was just talking about. And they were all the ones I just talked about, you know, communication, problem solving, writing, things, communications, things like that. But there was one hard skill that they did look for, and that was Excel. If you knew how to use Microsoft Excel, you were golden in this, in this job market. So I guess my uh, you know, they're in the old movie, The Graduate, the Dustin Hoffman character recommends, you know, going into plastics. Well, uh, I guess my recommendation today is to learn Excel. Yeah. And I, as somebody who went to business school, worked on Wall Street, Microsoft Excel, and, and also who, who planned my own wedding, big five day Indian wedding with 500 plus people, Microsoft Excel is 
such an important skill, even in wedding planning. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't know how a wedding planner today can can plan without knowing how to use Excel and PowerPoint and Microsoft Word. Um, it, it's it, it's just changed. These industries have changed so much, and it's it's not what they used to be. It's not what you think. But I'd also add in on top of Excel. So it's a good thing you brought that up because that wasn't in my original kind of skills that you should learn when you graduate. But um, that's that's a hard technical skill. But there are four areas that I think regardless of what you want to be, whether you want to be an accountant or a doctor or an attorney or a construction worker, there are four skills and those four skills you touched on most of them. It's reading, it's writing well and effectively, it's speaking, and it's the ability to use and adapt to technology. I think if you can do those, master those four areas, then you can really become an expert in whatever it is that you want to pursue. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, that's, you know, and again, I think the writing piece of it is critical. I, I once overheard a job interview when I was having breakfast here in Washington, D.C., where I live. And and uh, and, and and one of the guys was talking to the uh, person he was interviewing and he said, you know, I, I majored in math. But if I had to do it all over again, I would actually major in English because I think writing is the differentiating skill right now that no matter what job you're in, if you're a good writer and a clear communicator, you can actually do that job better than a lot of other people. And I should also say in English. So you, you brought up English. I say in English because no matter what country you're in, wh whether you're in India or the Philippines or the UK or the United States, if uh, mastering these in English will just set you apart. And I went to my my wife when, when we were dating four years ago. We went to Cuba when it was easier to go to Cuba and do whatever you wanted there. So we visited Cuba. And the workers in Cuba who could speak English, they didn't become doctors or lawyers. They became waiters because that's how you can make great money in Cuba, by becoming a waiter and, and serving tourists and then them tipping you in U.S. standards or, or other Western standards. And you're making more money in one day than most Cubans are making in, in one month as a waiter, simply because you're able to speak English and communicate with the clientele, uh, you know, whatever food they want to order, whatever drinks they want. Um, and so all these skills that I brought up, English is, is one of them too. Mastering them in English, I think is so important. And I, I call English the world reserve language. Uh, it, it's probably true. Uh, and and not only knowing English, but but communicating um, and writing is so critical. And I don't think that this is where I think today's students, particularly in a, in a social media age, don't get the fact that if you can communicate clearly um, in writing and in speaking that and this the idea of telling stories, being able to communicate your message. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in, in Silicon Valley and I, I've noticed that even in pitching your idea, if you're able to communicate that clearly, sometimes people are willing to invest in you because of your, not because of you uh, or your idea, but because you've communicated it clearly. Yeah, I think it was important what you touched on whenever you were saying about the pandemic, how it sent you going back and taking classes on this, that, and the other. I think a lot of people need to realize, even after they come out of high school, they come out of college, come out of grad school, whatever, it's always a continuing education in today's world. And it can become so cheap, even when you're done with college, you know, to just continue taking these courses. And it's kind of crazy to me that I'm looking at these courses for my kids. We homeschool them. And like, we just signed up our son for a, a lesson about creative writing. And it's $110, you know, for basically a semester of classes. But then, you know, you look at your college, if I were to put them in like a college course for that, it'd be insane. But I think people, it's important for people to realize that even if you're done with school, you're not done and it's not nearly as expensive as you think it is. No, and you're always learning, right? I think that's the key here is that we have to, we have to um, really instill in our kids 
this idea of always learning. Yeah, and that's why uh, I guess I look kind of young for my age, and I still get from random people, are, are you a student? And <laughs> even, though, even though I graduated, my, I did my master's, finished nine years ago, um, I say, yes, I'm a student of life. And I've actually learned more after I was done with my formal schooling and even the job that I currently have um, in, in the technology space, I didn't learn any of this stuff in school. None of it. I, I had to go out and, like you said, like Adam said, download courses online, buy books on Amazon, teach myself a lot of this stuff. And I've never stopped. It's even after my business uh, hit the six figure mark, I didn't say, OK, well, I'm, I'm good financially now. I'm just never going to learn again. Uh, I'm just constantly adapting, constantly trying to learn as much as possible. And th look, this episode that we're having with Jeffrey, it's not just for students. This is for the 50 million plus unemployed people or underemployed people in the United States. It's for the hundreds of millions of people um, who are who don't have a job right now worldwide and for the billions of people who might be looking at switching jobs or switching careers it's for everyone not just students so that's why the, i mean i'm excited about this episode because when my son gets older i want him to listen to this because there's just a lot of valuable nuggets um, that anyone can take away from this episode and i think uh, when you talked about english being the world reserve language or it reminded me of malcolm gladwell's book outliers i don't know if uh, either of you have read that but yep. he talked about how in Korea they were kept having plane accidents at a higher rate than anywhere else. And they went in and they realized that a lot of it was because their, um, their people couldn't speak English as well as they needed to in order to communicate with the pilots because all communication was done in English. And so they actually sent them all to English courses and it drastically reduced the issues that they were having in their, uh, in their flights just because everybody learned English better. It was kind of an incredible thing to me that I never would have thought of as being the solution to plane safety is uh, whether you land or not could be based on the fact of if your pilot fully understands English and if the tower, the control center knows English as well. It just kind of blew me away when I read that. Yeah, well, uh, Jeffrey, let's now talk uh, shift, shift topics just a little bit because I'm curious. I haven't been to a college campus, like I said, since I graduated, and there's been a lot of changes. As a an education reporter, an award-winning journalist who covers higher education, what are college campuses like right now? Are they like empty ghost towns, or are they back to normal? Um, it depends on which campuses you're talking about, but some are empty ghost towns where they have no, everybody's online. Others are half and half. Um, others have everybody back on campus, but it's a very different lifestyle. You know, there's not a lot of mixing of students on campus, at least. So you're seeing a mixture of, uh, of, of responses on this front. Okay. Now, how does this, we talked about the financial aspect and what the CFO knows about the finances for a university, what they don't know, but how does this kind of new abnormal what does it mean for campus staff? Because it's not just about the students, it's also about the professors, the staff, even the people who, who clean the, the libraries. What does that mean for them and how can they adjust to this kind of new work from home, digital education system? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I don't think we've often seen colleges and universities as workplaces uh, where people do work, right? And, and increasingly we're seeing among financial aid counselors and academic counselors that they're able to do this work from home. And, and I think that colleges can also, again, find ways to, to reduce costs. I think that in many ways, if, if a person could do a job, they had a person do a job rather than if technology do a job. And, uh, and so that's what we're, we're seeing right now with uh, this work from home culture, even on college campuses. And the question I have is whether colleges leaders are going to learn from that and be able to uh, and be able to implement changes coming out of this that will reduce costs in their workforce. Great. Well, Jeffrey Salingo, the website is Jeff Salingo. That's S-E-L-I-N-G-O. Jeff Salingo. 
Com, award-winning journalist for multiple well-known nationally, internationally known publications, special advisor to the president at Arizona State University, visiting scholar at Georgia Tech, and best-selling author of multiple books. We've touched on every single one of these on this episode. His first book, College Unbound, The Future of Higher Education and What It Means for Students, Excellent, excellent topics on that book that we've discussed on this show. Also, his other books, There is Life After College, What Parents and Students Should Know About Navigating School to Prepare for the Jobs of Tomorrow. Touched on that. Also, Mook Yu, who is getting the most out of on- online education and why. And his new book, Who Gets In and Why, A Year Inside College Admissions. Jeff Salingo, thanks so much for joining us on our show. Before you leave, any last thoughts you want to share with our listeners or uh, anything else you want to promote? Um, well, thank you. Well, first of all, I host a podcast called Future You that gets into a lot of these issues. Uh, so you could download that. Uh, we're in season four. So that might be a Great. good thing to follow if you're, you're interested in these topics. Yeah, future you. And is there a website for that or is that at jeffsalingo.com? Jeffsalingo.com and and it's on all the uh, podcast platforms. So okay. Yeah, I didn't it. even know that you had your own podcast. That sounds really interesting. I'll have to check that out. So again, Jeff Salingo, thanks for coming on our show. To all our listeners, if you have any questions for Jeff, reach out to us in case if you're too afraid to reach out to him through his website, workfromhomeshow.com workfromhomeshow.com and our email is hello at workfromhomeshow.com you can check out all of our previous episodes at www.workfromhomeshow.com like i mentioned leave us a review like us on facebook twitter we're everywhere and until next time keep on working and studying from home